Volume 3, Book 5 Terror, the Order of the Day Chapter 1 Rushing Down We are now therefore got to the black, precipitous abyss, whither all things have long been tending. This is the darkest part of the revolution for Carlyle. The supremacy of Siegfried Robespierre, the end of any Girondin faction, let alone anything constitutionally monarchical or monarchical itself, completely gone, is that vision of France and those modes of French life. Be it so, says Carlyle, que le terreur soit à l'ordre du jour, which is the deputation of the Jacobins, uh, as told from the Histoire Parlementaire. The harvest of long centuries was ripening and whitening so rapidly of late, and now it has grown white and is reaped rapidly as it were in one day, reaped in this reign of terror and carried home to Hades and the pit. Unhappy sons of Adam, it is ever so. So again, from Carlyle's perspective, this terror, it's something that is undergoing a, an organic process, even though it is chaotic. Um, so in its own sense, it can be something that is reaped. The Gospel according to the new 5th of Jan evangelist Jean-Jacques, calling on men to amend each the whole world's wicked existence and be saved by the Constitution. Not realization of Christianity or of aught earthly do we discern in this reign of terror in this French Revolution, of which is the consummating destruction rather we do discern. As if 25 millions risen at length into the Pythian mood, had stood up simultaneously to say, with a sound which goes through far lands and times, that this untruth of an existence had become insupportable. O oh, ye hypocrisies! You speciosities, royal mantles, cardinal plush, cloaks, ye credos, formulas, respectabilities, fair painted sepulchres full of dead men's bones. Theorem becomes practice, as deluge then in Carlylean terms. Doctrine of fraternity, out of old Catholicism, does, it is true, very strangely in the vehicle of a Jean-Jacques Evangel, suddenly plump down out of its cloud firmament, and from a theorem determined to make itself a practice. Catholicism, classicism, sentimentalism, cannibalism, all isms that make up man in France are rushing and roaring in that gulf. And the theorem has become a practice. And whatsoever cannot swim, sinks. And this is why the chapter has the name Rushing Down. Carlyle's vision that the theorem has now become practice, i.e. the deluge rushing down. Neither shall the reader fancy that it was all black, this reign of terror. No, far from it. Carlyle does throw a bone here to the everyday experience. How many hammermen and squaremen, bakers, brewers, washers, ringers, over this France must ply their old daily work? Let the government be one of terror or one of joy. It does not matter to them. In this Paris there are twenty-three theatres nightly. Some count as many as 60 places of dancing. So you always have that, that twin thing. If you want to enter the body politic, it will be a reign of terror. If you want to show any buttress against those in power, it will be a reign of terror. But if you want to go about your daily life, it's possible. Chapter 2. Death. Let's start with Philippe Doléon. Philippe Galité, this cousin of a king, the old king. He says, Philippe well, was decreed accused along with the Girondins, and much to, his, much to his and their surprise. Though, of course, from Carlyle's perspective, he was a fool to think it would end otherwise. But he's not tried along with them. No, they are doomed and dead some three days when Philippe, after his long half-year in Durance at Marseille, arrives in Paris. It is, as we calculate, the 3rd of November, 1793. So, last we have a date on this deluge, this rainfall of terror that Carlyle is talking about in this book. There are also two notable female prisoners. They're also uh, put in ward there. Dame Dubarry and Josephine Beauharnais. Josephine Beauharnais, of course, will come into prominence with Napoleon. Philippe's indictment, though, is soon drawn. And at the door of the conciergerie, Philippe's attitude, it was erect, easy, almost commanding. He now knows his fate. 
Objecting or not objecting, the gallows vehicle gets underway. Philippe's dress is remarked for its elegant screen frock, waistcoat of white pique, yellow, buckskins, boots clear as warren, his air as before entirely composed, impassive, not to say, and easy and bromelian polite. Through street after street, slowly, amid execrations past the Palais Egalité, where loom Palais Royal. Cruel populace stopped him there some minutes. Dame de Buffon, she said, looked out on him in Jezebel head tire. Along with Ashla wall, there ran these words in huge tricolour print. Republic, one and indivisible. Liberty, egalité, fraternité, or death. National property. Philippe's eyes flashed hellfire one instant, but the next instant he was gone and he sat impassive, bromelian, polite. On the scaffold, Samson was for drawing off his boots. Tush, said Philippe. They will come better off after. Let us have done, he said. Dépêchons nous. So Philippe was not without virtue then, thinks Carlyle. Well, God forbid that there should be any living man without it. But he says there is some redemptive quality to this Philippe Galate. He, he got completely swept up. By the notions of a Camille de Milan, 1789, went along with it, kept going along with it, kept believing the dawn would break for him, possibly with himself as some sort of monarchical uh, constitutional monarch. And then perhaps he thought his son could inherit. Remember through when at the frontier, uh, de Mouriez was possibly plotting a coup whereby his son could become king. All of this has faded out. And so there is a stoicism to the acceptance of Philippe Galité. He would have seen all his family members take a similar fate. He knows he played his dice, and he knows uh, they have not come up with his numbers. He was a Jacobin prince of the blood. Consider what a combination. Also, unlike any Nero or any Borgia, he lived in the age of pamphlets. Chaos has reabsorbed him. Brave young Oliani Galité. He's gone to the Quad and the Grisson under the name of Corby, to teach mathematics. The Egalité family is at the darkest depths of the Nadir. A far nobler victim follows, says Carlyle. This is Jean-Marie Philippon, the wife of Roland. And in the Abbey prison she occupied Charlotte Corday's apartment, 8th of November then, clad in white, says Rioff, with her long black hair hanging down her girdle. She has gone to the judgment bar... There went with her a certain Lamarche, director of Assignat Printing, whose dejection she endeavoured to cheer. So these are just some of the others swept up by this terror. Nourisher to clear perennial womanhood, though but on logics, encyclopedes, and the gospel according to Jean-Jacques. Biography will long remember that trait of asking for a pen to write the strange thoughts that were rising in her. She was a, one of the age of the pamphlet, yet is still also swept away. Still crueler was the fate of poor Bailly, first national president, first mayor of Paris, doomed now for royalism, theatism, for that red flag business, the Champ de Mars. One may say in general for leaving his astronomy to meddle with revolution. It is the 10th of November, 1793. Bailly is led through the streets, howling populace, covering him with curses. Some days afterward, Roland Hearing the news of what happened on the 8th, embraces his kind friends at Rouen. Leaves their kind house, which had given him refuge, goes forth with farewell to Sad for Tears on the morrow morning, 16th of the month, some four leagues from Rouen, Paris word, near Berg Baudouin, in uh, Monsieur Normand's avenue, there is seen sitting leant against a tree a figure of a rigorous, wrinkled man, stiff now in the rigour of death. So, he doesn't even get the official end. By nave, then, his appearance at the Revolutionary Tribunal was the bravest, but it could not stead him. And Petion, once also of the extreme left, and named Petion Vertu, where is he? Civilly dead in the caves of Saint-Emilion, to be devoured of dogs. And Robespierre, who rode along with him on the shoulders of the people, is in the Committee Salut, civilly alive. Ex-Minister Clavier has killed himself in prison. Ex-Minister Lebrun, seized in a hayloft under the disguise of a working man, is instantly conducted to death. So really, if you were involved in the earlier phases of the revolution, that's where your susceptibility to the nadir lies. 
Let the guilty tremble, therefore, and the suspect and the rich, in a word of all manner, the culotic men. In Paris now are some twelve prisons. In France some forty-four thousand, thitherward thick as brown leaves in autumn. Russell and travel the suspect, shaken down by our revolutionary committees. Chapter 3. Destruction. And it gets worse. Those are the political deaths. But as Carlos says, little children are guillotined. This is the age of suspicion, you know. And aged men, too, in Brest, to like purpose, rules Jambon Saint-André, with an army of red nightcaps in Bordeaux, rules Talian, with his Isabeau and henchmen, Quades, Cussis, Celis, many fall, bloody pike in the nightcap, bearing supreme sway, the guillotine coining money. So these are some of the rural Jacobins now, uh, Saint-André being in charge in Brest, in Bou Bordeaux, Talian. These aren't even the best of the best because they're sent out to the regional uh, parts of France to to instigate the terror there. Like a new proserpine. She, by this red gloomy dice, is gathered. And they say soften this is stone heart a little. Manier at Orange in the south, Le Bon at Arras in the north, become world's wonders. Fouché, Manier, Barras, Freron scour the southern departments like reapers with their guillotine sickle. Marseille has taken part under martial law. It is Jordan Coupet. Him that they have clutched in these martial law districts. The last of the Girondins then go down. Least of all can Lyon escape. Lyon, which was always a holdout against us. The Lyon Jacobins were hidden in cellars at one point. The Girondin municipality, they waxed pale. The mains of Chalier are to be appeased. The Republic, maddened to the sibylline pitch, has bared her right arm. Behold! Representative Fouché, it is Fouché of Nantes, a name too become well known. He with a patriotic company goes duly in wondrous procession to raise the corpse of Chalier. Chalier was the Jacobin who got uh, executed in Lyon by the Girondins. Holy books are part of the funeral pile amid cries of vengeance, vengeance, which writes Fouché shall be satisfied. So Fouché has uh, scoured Nantes, which was a stronghold in the west. And now he heads to Lyon in the uh, central east. Lyon is in fact a town to be abolished. Not Lyon henceforth, but Commune Affranchi, township freed. Lyon rebelled against the Republic. Lyon, therefore, can be no more. That is the mindset. They literally need to change the name of the city. So associated was it with rebellion against the ideal of the revolution. Corpses the first were flung into the Rhone. Younger men them singing the Marseillaise, Jacobin National Guards give fire. This is also the time of the siege of Toulon. Where we have General Carteau here, a Walloon painter elevated in the troubles of Marseille, General Dupé, a Walloon medical man elevated into the troubles of Piedmont, who, under Conseil, took Lyon but cannot take Toulon. Toulon, of course, has been taken by the British. Finally, we have General de Gommier, pupil of Washington, no less. And, of course, we have Bonaparte, one of the best artillery officers yet met with. And still Toulon is not taken. It is the fourth month now, December, in slave style, Frusterius of Frimaire in new style. So again, they don't even know what month it is in which to take this the city back. But eventually, it does crack. 19th of December, 1793, Toulon is once more the Republic's. Um, of course, the Toul siege of Toulon, the involvement of Napoleon, this is the beginning of the myth. And hence, even in the nadir of the chaos of revolution, you see the new king being born. And that's the Carlalian position here. Napoleon has come in and helped raise this siege of Toulon and can re-cement a structure into, out of this destruction, of course, which is what Carlyle is calling this chapter. December and January nights over Nantes town, confused noise of musketry and tumult as of rage and lamentation mingling with the everlasting moan of the Loire waters there. Nantes town is sunk to sleep. The represent Carrier is not sleeping. Wool capped company of Marat is not sleeping. Why unmoors that flat bottomed craft, the Gabar? About eleven at night. Ninety priests under the hatches. They are going to Belle Isle in the middle of the Loire stream on signal. The Gabar is scuttled. 
She sinks with all her cargo. Sentence of deportation, writes Carrier, was executed vertically. The 90 priests with their gabar coffins lie deep. So here we have a revolution going against the priests in Nantes. Guillotining there was at Nantes as well, till the headsmen sank worn out. Noyade, women, men tied together, feet and feet, hands and hands, all flung in. This they call marriage republicain. The Republican marriage, cruel as the panther of the woods, the she-bear bereaved of her whelps. Republic, one and indivisible, then, says Carlyle, in summation of all this destruction. She is the newest birth of nature's waste of inorganic deep, which men name Orcus, chaos, primeval night. So there he is actually calling it inorganic. Orcus and chaos is an inorganic um, essence. There's different to when he's calling it a, 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 the reap of something which is was in the process there. Um, it's such that the d- disintegration seems to be in the process, but then Carlyle assumes that the worst activities in the darkness of, of the nadir itself become inorganic, become this orcus. Proudhon, the dull, blustering printer and able editor as yet of a Jacobin editor, will become a renegade one and publish large volumes on these matters, crimes of the revolution. So this Proudhon uh, actually was once the, an editor of the Jacobin style uh, pamphlets, <laughs> turns against them because Again, once if you were the average baker, butcher, perhaps you could have survived. But once you were involved in any sort of the political revolutionary gears, such as an editor of the Jacobin, yes, they could turn against you in any moment. You know, this this age of suspicion, this age of he who does not go far enough will be guillotined. Adding innumerable lies with all, as if the truth were not sufficient. This crimes of the Revolution by Proudhon, he ends up even piling on lies in the midst of the truth. That is this republic and the national tigress. It is a new birth, a fact of nature among formulas in an age of formulas. Chapter 4. Camagnole Complete Last Corpus Christus Day, 1792, the whole world and sovereign authority itself walked in religious gala, with a quite devout air. It was a Gallican hierarchy and church, and church formulas. They seemed to flourish. Little brown leaved or so, but not browner than the late years or decades to flourish far wide. In the sympathies of an unsophisticated people, defying philosophism, legislature, and encyclopedia. Since that Corpus Christi day, Brunswick has come, and the emigrants, San Levande, and eighteen months of time. To all flourishing, especially to brown leaved flourishing, there comes what had never so slowly an end. On the 7th of November, a certain uh, citoyen parrain, curate of the Boissis Le Bertrand, writes to the convention that he has all his life been preaching a lie. There is no religion but liberty, he says. Let atheist Maréchal Lalande and little atheist Nagion rejoice. Let Clout, speaker of mankind, present to the convention his evidences of the Mohammedan religion, a work evincing the nullity of all religions with thanks. We will be... We were seeing this with the distrust of the clergy in Nantes. The terror is leading itself into the atheistic guise, and we're going to end up with the worship of the Temple of Reason, of course, eventually. That's what Carlyle's building up to here. There's no one God only. There is le peuple. That's what le peuple have to replace the concept of God. Men dance the Carmagnole all night about the bonfire. This is the Carmagnole becoming complete, that the Carmagnole, the people, the purple, become God. All highways jingle with metallic priests' tackle, beaten broad, sent to the convention. Danton glooming considerably in his place, meanwhile, and demanding that there be prose and decency and future. Such old hallow tide have they in this year, once named of Grace, 1793. This brave Camagnole dances hardly jigs itself out. Demoiselle Candel, of the opera, a woman fair to look upon and well rouged, she born in Palancan, shoulder high, with a red woollen nightcap and azure mantle, garlanded with oak, holding in her hand the pike of the Jupiter Purple. So this is again Demoiselle Candel with the pike in the opera is taking on an almost pagan like um embodiment of of a revolutionary god here jupiter purple 
O national convention, wonder of the universe, is our new divinity goddess of reason. Here we have it. Si Davant, cathedral called of Notre Dame and executed a few strokes in worship of her, so Notre Dame becomes the temple in worship of reason. Reason taking seat in the high altar of Notre Dame. Hymn to liberty, words by Chenier, music by Gossec. It is the first of the feasts of reason. Reason, sat in azure mantle aloft, in a serene manner, cannoneers, pipe in mouth, serving her as acolytes. Adoration of reason went all over the Republic through these November and December weeks, till the church woodwork was burnt out. And such gifts of church spoil are chiefly the work of the Armée Révolutionnaire. Even by some uncertain shadow of Usher Maillard, the old Bastille hero, leader of the Minards, September man in grey, clerk, Vincent of the War Office, one of Pache's old clerks with a head heated by ancient orators, had a main hand in the appointments, least in the staff appointments. First exploit is to prostrate what royal or ecclesiastical monument, crucifix or the like there may be, plant a cannon in the steeple, fetch down the bell without climbing for it, bell and belfry together. The revolutionary army will do its work generally and gently by ladder and wrench. They go up, they take down the bells. The bell is replaced by the cannon. No longer will you be called out by the bell to attend your service. It is the cannon that attends the service. It is fear. This is the terror. And Carlyle is equating the terror with the drawing down of the church bells. Chapter 5. Like a thunder cloud. Not swifter pulses that guillotine. In dread systole diastole. In the Place de la Revolution. Then smites the sword of patriotism. Smiting Simaria back to its own borders from the sacred soil. The anarchy, we may say, has organized itself. Society is literally overset. Its old forces working in mad activity, but in the inverse order, destructive and self-destructive. Curious to see how all still refers itself to some head and fountain. Not even an anarchy, but must have a centre to revolve around. So when you invert something, it still has certain properties. Think of when you have a positron. It is still seen to be, have properties similar to the electron, but then the charge is opposite. Carlyle's looking at this anarchy almost as the same when it reaches its complete nadir, in its flux it's difficult to ascertain, but when it completes its nadir, as counterpoised to what was there before the revolution, you begin to see the same forms but in inverse order. Curious to see how it still refers to itself in some head and fountain. That's what he's talking about there. It's now some six months since the Committee of Salut Public came into existence. Only six months since, since it came in. This is this Committee of Salut Public, the one that, through its organ could finally get rid of the Girondins. Some three months since Danton proposed that all power should be given to it, and a sum 50 millions in the government be declared revolutionary, the government itself be declared revolutionary. The nine, if they should even rise to the twelve, have become permanent. Always re-elected within their term and then runs out, the Salé public, Sûreté Générale, have assumed their ulterior form and mode of operating. This is terror order of the day. The Salé public becoming cemented, becoming rigid. Committee of Public Salvation as Supreme, of General Surety as Subaltern. These like a lesser and greater council. A Robespierre, a Biot, a Collot, a Couton, a Saint-Just. These are the reddest of the red of the red caps, Jacobins. Not to mention the still meaner Amar, Vadier in the Surete Generale. These are your cloud compellers. Triumph of the Republic. Destruction of the enemies of the Republic. Spiritual endowment. Storming whirlwind. Heard by a city municipality of Paris. All in red nightcaps since the 4th of November last. Sleek Mayor Pache. This is the latest. I mean, we've seen what's happened to the previous mayors of Paris and Belly, Pétion. They've met their end. The revolution has eaten them. Studious to be safe in the middle. Chomet. Hébert. Valet. Enrio. A great commandant. There are also new names who lurked in the shadows and are now happy to don the red cap. Intend to have churches planted, to have reason ordered, suspects cut down, and the revolution triumph. Perhaps carrying the matter too far? Danton was heard to grumble at the civic strophes and to recommend prose and decency. 
Robespierre also grumbles at an overturning superstition. We did not mean to make a religion of atheism. In fact, your Chomet and company constitute a kind of hyper-Jacobinism. Rabid faction des enlages. Which has given orthodox patriotism some umbrage of late months. And the 44,000 of other townships, each with revolutionary committees based on Jacobin daughter society, enlightened by the spirit of Jacobinism, quickened by the 40 sous a day. National convention, elected for one, mother of patriots. Patriotism, self-elected for another. There ought to be an opposition side. Côte cried Chabot. If none else will form it, I will. People say to me, you will all get guillotined in your turn, first you. And Bazir and Danton, then Robespierre himself. The prophetic words by Chabot, who realizes them, has to be in opposition or else it will continue churning, eating itself. Already, Robespierre. No one th- thinks you get more than Robespierre. But, but Carlyle here is saying, Chomet and company, these hyper Jacobins, rabid factions of Enrage, are even making Robespierre think, well, hang on. Convention of commissioners are formed. These men, powerfuler than the king or Kaiser. That's the, that's the fear. They say to whom so they meet, do, and he must do it. All men are at their disposal, for France is one huge city in siege. This has been the case since Dumouriez. They smite with requisitions and force loan. They have the power of life and death. Saint-Just and Le Bar order the rich classes of Strasbourg to strip off their shoes and send them to the armies. Yeah, it is a fulgonous Olympus. This salut public. Chapter 6 Do thy duty. Cut off from Sweden and the world, the Republic must learn to make steel for itself. Sweden, of course, was a great export steel at the time. This is the beginning of the total war economy. Styles of Chalville ring with gun making. 258 forgers stand in the open spaces of Paris itself. Chemists of the Republic have taught us miracles, swath tanning. The French people, risen against tyrants. The French people, risen, risen against tyrants, come from the 28th of August, 1794, decree of the National Convention. Le peuple français debout contre le tyran. On the frontiers, the show itself is a glorious pro patria mori. Ever since Dumouriez's defection, three convention representatives attend every general. The Committee of Salut has sent them. Often with laconic order only, do thy duty. Fais ton devoir. Dash with your Gaelic impetuosity on Austria, England, Prussia, Spain, Sardinia, Pitt, Coburg, York, and the devil of the world. It's all the members of the coalition and their leaders against them. Behind us is the guillotine. Before us is victory. Pathiosis. Millennium without end. They're invoking a sort of like Roland against the Saracens, against the enemy. Not only does Dugomier, conqueror of Toulon, drive Spain back, he invades Spain. And of course this is where Roland is said to have died on those Pyrenees. General Dugomier. He invades it by the eastern Pyrenees. General Muller shall invade it by the western. Near the bottom, they are not kings, able men of a sort, these generals. Chosen from the 749 French kings with his order, do thy duty. At Honshuten, far in the afternoon, he declares the battle is not lost. That it must be gained and fights himself with his own obstetric hand. This is the idea of Themistocles against Xerxes. Who has the back to the wall? The French here have the back to the wall. So they will fight harder and faster than the coalition at this moment. That, of course, will change, but it'll take a long time. It'll take ultimately until um, when Napoleon is in Moscow to see it on the other side, effectively. General Houchard, it would appear, stood behind a hedge on this Hon shooting occasion. So Houchard is the one who, uh, particular that Carl is talking about here, fighting the fight, good fight himself. A sort of mini king doing his duty. Wherefore, they have since guillotined him. New General Jourdain, late Sergeant Jourdain, commands in his stead at the battles of Watigny, and he forces the Austrians behind the Sambar again. So Jourdain is another 
uh, general who'll come to prominence. The moment requires him and he is there. See San Just in the lines of uh, Weissenberg. San Just himself, though physically of a timid, apprehensive nature, he still charges with the Alsatian peasants armed hastily for, for the nonce. A solemn face of him blazing into flame, his black hair and tricolour hat tefata flowing in the breeze. See devant, Peugeon, Pichicru, see devant, Sergeant Hoche. These are other names that do thy duty. Risen now to do to be generals. I've done wonders here. Tell Pichicru. Uh, was meant for the church, was teacher of mathematics once, Brienne's school, his remarkable pupil there was, the boy Napoleon Bonaparte. The mountains are burst, and the many and Enceladus is disimprisoned, the captains founding on four parchments of nobility are blown with their parchments across the Rhine into lunar limbo. So this is an interesting one, the liberation of promotion has actually helped rise men of merit Hosh Pichigru who will in turn enable the same thing of Napoleon in the centre of Paris you have the anarchy and you have the chaos but on the frontier when you're fighting the enemy Carlyle seems to think the reality of the war will make it so that the high fancy theorems of the revolution are not really borne out because you still have to win the battle in front of you and the liberation actually does enable the upward mobility of those with merit, good commanders, to rise to the top. Snows of winter, flowers of summer, continue to be stained with warlike blood. There's no cease, there's no seasonality to the warfare anymore. Jacobinism wears itself to national vanity. The soldiers of the Republic are becoming, as we prophesied, the very sons of fire. Majesty of Prussia, Majesty of Spain, will by and by acknowledge his sins in the Republic and make peace of Baal. So this is the first official peace, the peace of Baal. Prussia and Spain make peace, June 1794. There is an unconquerable in man when he stands on his rights of man. Let despots and slaves and all people know this, and only them that stand on the wrongs of man tremble to know it. Monde, Pinto, Munchausen, Cagliostro, uh, Samanazar. They have been great, but they are not the greatest. Barer, Barer, Anacreon of the guillotine. Must inquisitive pictorial history. A new edition ask again, how is it that the v- Vonga, this its glorious suicidal sinking, and with resentful brush, dash a bend sinister of contumelious Lambach through the, and it, alas, alas, the Vengur after fighting bravely, did sink altogether, as other ships do, her captain, above 200 and her crew escaping gladly in British boats, and this same enormous spiring feet and rumour of the Salmo's piercing turns out to be an enormous inspiring non-entity. So what's Carlyle getting at here? He's talking about Compare, Bar- uh, Compare uh, Barrer, Lord Ho, Annual Register of 1790. Barrer at this point though is starting to turn against uh, Robespierre and the like within the committee. How silent now sits royalism, sits all aristocratism, respectability with kept its gig, the honour now and the safety to its to poverty, not to wealth. Higher than all Frenchmen, the domestic stock jobber flourishes. In a day of paper money, the farmer also flourishes. Farmers' houses, says Mercier, have become like pawnbrokers' shops. All manner of furniture, apparel, vessels of gold and silver accumulate themselves there. Bread is precious. The man who can make that tangible reality be it the victory in the battlefield or bread in the home front, he becomes the most valuable asset. And daily we say like a black spectre, silently through the life tumult, passes the revolution cart. Writing on the walls, it's mene, mene, thou art weighed and found wanting. Of course, the biblical saying from the book of Daniel there. Spectre, with which one has grown familiar, Men have adjusted themselves, compliant issues not from that death tumbril. Weak women and sidevants, their plumage and finery all tarnished, sit there like a silent gaze, as if with infinite black. At Moudon, says Montgayard, with considerable calmness, there was a tannery of human skins. That's complete terror order of the day. That's horror. 
Such are the guillotine as seemed with flaying, which perfectly good. Wash leather was made for breeches and other uses. And whether that's true or not, Carlyle leaves to the reader to interpret. Monk Gaillard claims it was there. Alas, is man's civilization only rapage, through which the savage nature of him can still burst, infernal as ever. Nature still makes him, and has an infernal in her, as well as the celestial. But he has sown the seeds there, Carlyle, with the mention of Barrere, beginning to think about Thermidor. He's beginning to think about the July crisis of 1794. And it's there that Carlyle will pick up the, the turning of this beast back towards something assembling the celestial. Once it's gone true, it's absolute carnal and bestial nature. 